Okay, in this video, I want to tell you a little bit about Haskell Language Server. Haskell Language Server is a separate tool for Haskell that gives you a good editor integration. So it, um, it works by communicating with your editor via something which is called LSP or the Language Server Protocol. And most editors at, these time, at this time uh, actually support uh, LSP. So in particular, VS Code that I'm using here does, but many other editors, in particular editors such as Vim or NeoVim or Emacs, they um, all support it as well. In order to get it working though, you do not just need Haskell Language Server itself installed, which is something that typically happens as part of the installation process of your tool chain. So for example, if you're using GHC up to get GHC, you can also get HLS, but um, just check out the setup instructions again for this course. Um, if you haven't done that, there are a couple of um, pieces of information there. Um, but you also need to configure uh, Haskell language server to work in your particular editor. And that is different a little bit from editor to editor um, that is documented online. But um, in the case of uh, Visual Studio Code, um, the thing that you need is this Haskell uh, extension for VS Code that must be installed. Um, and actually there are lots of different settings for this, which you typically do not have to change, but I want to uh, briefly highlight a few because my configuration in this video is a little bit different from the configuration I'm using in most of the other videos because I typically have a couple of things that I personally don't like as much or that I find a little bit distracting, distracting disabled, and I'm enabling them now. So um, one thing is that, that I'm uh, in this video, I'm uh, going to show the use of a formatting provider. So for Haskell, there are different formatting providers and I typically have none enabled here, but I'm now using sort of the default setting, which is Ormolu. And um, uh, another thing that I want to highlight is the HLint plugin. Um, because um, HLint is providing um, a useful informative messages. So that is enabled here, HLint Diagnostics and HLint Code Actions. And the eval plugin. Um, plugin here means plugin for Haskell Language Server. Haskell Language Server itself has sort of a plugin architecture where um, lots of separate pieces of functionality are provided by different plugins, which are typically all shipped with HLS. So you have them all, but you can individually enable and uh, disable those plugins. Um, another thing that I should briefly point out is that HLS is sensitive to the compiler version you're using. So you have to have uh, Haskell language server installed exactly for the GHC version uh, that you're planning to use. So let's uh, get rid of this here again. So in terms of features, the most obvious feature that you're getting from all this is that uh, like while you're typing code, you get on the fly error messages. We have seen this in, in uh, other videos already, right? So if I'm, if I'm making a type error, if I'm writing something like x equals the string foo cons the string bar, I'm actually getting uh, a type error here because foo is a string and bar is also a string, but cons expects an element of a list to the left and a list to the right. So bar does not have the expected type. And, and this is broken down here to the error message that we are expecting here, a list of strings at this point, but we are getting a string. And um, you also always get information down here, which actually tells you what is the, um, what is the uh, inferred type at this, um, at this position. And um, I guess also the expected type at this position. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, in this particular case, it does not give you any additional information over the error message, but sometimes it might. So if we fix this and for example, just turn this into a list, then the next thing you can see is that you get up here, you get, um, uh, well, actually now you get a warning. Um, so that's the yellow underline, right? That we have a, a binding without a type signature, but you also get what's called a code lens here. So this is not part of the text that I've written, 
but it is the inferred type and you can just click on this and then it's inserted as a uh, top level type signature. Right? In general, this is not the way of uh, writing Haskell programs that I propose because I think you should typically start with a type signature because it helps in the design of programs. But nevertheless, if you have a piece of code where the type signature is missing, then you typically get it inferred from GHC and you have this easy way with HLS of just adding it. Okay. Um, as a next example, let's uh, look at um, one of the functions that we have been implementing in um, the first set of assignments, which is called is ascending, um, and it's taking a list of integers to a bool. And is ascending is um, is unusual in the sense that we uh, need three different cases in order to implement it correctly. So we need to distinguish the empty list case, the one element list case, and the um, case where we have at least two elements in a list. So, um, and um, uh, yeah, so we would write the three cases as uh, something like this is ascending empty list, is ascending x cons the empty list, is ascending x cons y cons y s. All right. Um, if you have this, you see lots of warnings are popping up. Um, that is for unused identifiers and um, potentially for name shadowing, which I haven't even noticed because I have defined X up here. And so now the local bindings are shadowing that name, which is allowed, but it is a little bit misleading, right? Because then you have multiple X's and principal in the module and it's not quite clear immediately to the reader what you're referring to. And um, now it's saying that X is uh, defined here in the pattern, but not used. But you um, also have the whole error messages, which we've also seen in some other videos being mentioned. So they are very useful for interactively developing your code. Um, it's very recommended that you use these holes. And the really cool thing is that they tell you um, the type that is being expected, but also the types of all the things that are locally in scope, right? Here we have X and Y in scope, which are both an int, and we have YS in scope, which is a list of int, and that can be very helpful. But then you also see this blue squiggly line here, and that is an informative error message, and that is coming from HLint. And HLint is yet again a separate tool, which is like usable through Haskell language server, and which you may have to install separately in order to use it, but it, it can be um, useful. And um, one of the, uh, well, what it does is it gives you advice about how you could make your, your uh, Haskell code stylistically better. It does not catch all different things, but it catches or gives suggestions about quite a few things. It's also not the case that you should always blindly um, do everything that HLint uh, says. We are going to see an example of, of that uh, in, in a moment. But here it actually makes a good suggestion because just as um, on in expressions, Haskell has syntactic sugar for lists. So a list that contains only the element one can be written as one cons the empty list, but it can also be written as one just in square brackets. And um, the same thing is true for patterns. So we can write a pattern for a list that contains exactly one element as x cons the empty list, or we can write it as uh, square bracket open x square bracket close, uh, such as uh, suggested here. So we could manually apply this suggestion, but we can also just click on, on this uh, little thing here, um, which is um, giving us the code actions, which are, again are provided by HLS, and we can say apply the hint uh, the, uh, from HLint uh, to use the list literal pattern, and then we get the rewrite done automatically. Okay. Um, and now, if we complete the definition, so I think it should be that an empty list is always ascending, and the one element uh, list is always ascending, and um, uh, this list is ascending. Now we have to agree whether we mean strictly ascending or non-strictly ascending. I think the exercise required strictly ascending, so then x should be less than y, and y 
Uh, well, and is ascending, we want to make a recursive call on y cons ys. And now we have one warning left here. By the way, there is another um, a code action here, which allows you to disable the warnings. That is not something which I would usually suggest because most of the warnings are actually useful. So what we want here is to replace this with an underscore to make the warning go away. Um, if we want to try out the uh, is ascending function directly, then we can also use um, HLS um, and the so-called eval plugin. So if we make a comment and we write these uh, three uh, uh, angle brackets or greater than uh, symbols uh, that looks a little bit like a prompt. We can actually write a, a Haskell expression that can refer to things from the current module. So if I write is ascending and then two, three, five. I now get another so-called code lens here and if I click on this then it's evaluating this according to my code and is telling me that the list 235 is actually ascending. And if I make another example here, is ascending, um, let's say uh, 276, right? oops, sorry. And I click on evaluate here, I do get false. And you see that there is also a refresh here, which means that if you've already got it evaluated, but now I'm, for example, changing my definition. So let's say I'm changing the less than to a greater than here, then click on refresh here, then this will become false and click on refresh here. And this one is still false because it is not ascending either to the original or to the um, wrong definition I have now. Right? So let's let's go back here and refresh again and refresh again. Um, one possible fit pitfall in this context is that in many of the uh, assignment files I'm using this particular style of documenting examples. So in this situation you would see something like is ascending equals error to do. Right? rather than the actual implementation and the rest would be commented out. And then I'm giving examples of how it should be, but um, uh, the eval plugin will pick this up. And if you click on refresh here now, you will actually get the error message printed. I mean, so there is a, a sort of a weird way here that it's not actually even showing you that um, an error is being triggered. That is uh, like an artifact of the eval plugin. But, um, but that's not really helpful, right? Because um, uh, now you've just r replaced an example with something which is no longer meaningful. So don't, don't click on refresh if you see this in, in the assignment files, right? Keep, keep the given examples around as a way to, to, test, your, to test your own code. Okay. Um, right, so one more thing that I want to show is uh, that you can use auto formatting. So let's again um, uh, uh, do this. And um, so sometimes um, in particular, when you're less used to a new language, you um, don't really want to focus on spacing very much and you may use some weird layouts right, that make code difficult to read and would make me complain about this piece of code because it is difficult to read. Now um, with um, HLS you can use an auto formatter as I have briefly mentioned in the beginning and um, so you can uh, call a command to format your document and um, I'm not sure whether this works for me because I'm rarely using it. Um, I think it may not. Um, but normally, because I don't have the formatter installed, um, normally if you, if you have it, you would automatically get your code reformatted um, in the right way, right? And uh, no, well, not necessarily the right way, but in a consistent way, right? There is no one true way of formatting this, but it would, um, I don't know exactly the style that uh, is going to be used, but it would um, sort of restore consistent spacing between all the operators and uh, would do something like this, right? Um, and you uh, don't have to manually do it. So that um, 
is a useful is a useful thing. Um, one more thing is that with HLint specifically, and in this course specifically, you sometimes get uh, strange kinds of suggestions. Uh, so if we look at OR, for example, which um, is predefined as a predefined function from the prelude. And uh, we have seen that before. It um, takes a list of booleans and computes a boolean, um, or of <clears throat> the empty list is uh, false and or of x comes xs is x and then the binary or or of xs. Um, you see uh, that again we get a hlint um, thing. By the way one other interesting feature which I just comes to mind is that um, for, for infix operators you are given the priorities if you hover over them by, by HLS. So you can see that um, the priority of the logical and is three and the priority of the less than is four. So less than binds stronger than and. So that is uh, useful to know. And, um, also that the cons operator has a priority of five and um, binds even stronger. So, um, so that can be uh, useful to know as well. But what I wanted to point out here is that the HLint suggestion here that you're getting is to use fold R in order to define um, OR. And you can define OR in terms of fold R, but it is a function that we haven't learned about yet. And um, rather than just blindly following the suggestion and replacing a piece of code that we should understand with something that we might not yet understand and will only hopefully in the future learn about, um, we might want to just disable this warning because um, the suggestion is a little bit distracting otherwise. So we can click on this again and now say we want to um, uh, ignore the hint use fold R in this module. And what this will do is it will add an annotation as a compiler pragma in the top of the module that instructs HLint to ignore this warning for the scope of this module and then the, uh, the warning itself uh, disappears. Right, so there are many other useful features, um, sort of little code actions, code lenses, um, this kind of stuff that we've seen. And of course, the whole interactive error message uh, handling which is uh, very, very convenient. Actually, one feature that I would really like to have and that uh, HLS had at some point, but it is currently um, not available, but it would be extremely useful if it was restored, and I hope it will be again, is that it can automatically do a case split, right? Um, so if I write a function such as or xs, a typical um, operation is that we say we want to pattern match on the various different patterns that are available for lists and as I said many times there are there's a standard design pattern where you want to split the access case into one for the empty list and one for cons and it would be very nice if this could just be done automatically by means of a code action that we could split into all the different cases that are uh, available depending on the type of the thing that we are actually uh, performing this pattern match on. And um, yeah, so HLS had a plugin in the past called Wingman that was able to do this. Um, Wingman is currently unfortunately unmaintained, but I think there is a good chance that uh, at some point in the not too distant future, this feature will make it back into HLS. And it, that is a, a very helpful thing. But even without it, I think the support given by HLS is fantastic and you should um, leverage its power. Um, perhaps it's also a good place to say, oh, um, like one thing that I would suggest uh, against uh, is enabling some sort of um, uh, uh, AI-based support for um, programming, in particular during learning, because if you get lots of suggestions generated by AI, you may be quicker in achieving what you want, right? But you will not actually spend the time to understand all the concepts and the goal, hopefully, of, that you currently have is to learn Haskell. And it is better to like have to do things yourself, at least in the beginning, in order to memorize the concepts and actually um, truly grasp them. Okay, that's it for this video.